So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? There are approximately 7 billion people on the planet and 21% of them do not have access to clean drinking water. That's about 2 billion people whose lives are at risk. That bottle of water that you leave on your desk and throw it half full doesn't come as easy to a large part of the world. Our system aims to bring clean water to all nations and people who do not have access to it. The desalination industry is mostly implemented in large scale plants such as the one shown here. Many areas globally have access to water services, but don't trust the cleanliness of their water and choose bottled water as a drinking source. Our product will allow these individuals without access to these plants to remove their dependency on plastic in an economically efficient way. This will help to tackle the problem of plastic in the ocean at its source. The first step for our design was finding stakeholders in the project. We identified stakeholders as consumers, local governments, Lassonde, our team in university, water municipalities, humanitarian organizations, and bottled water companies. We then tried to define what a typical consumer would look like to us. We started by finding areas with high water stress that have access to salt water and sunlight. We also considered the economy of the location because our product would need funding from these consumers. One of the best of these locations was the suburbs of Rio de Janeiro. Rio has water services such as functional showers and sinks, but the water is of questionable drinking quality due to tropical storms and developing infrastructure. We named our typical consumer Maria. She's a single mother living around Rio de Janeiro who relies on bottled water for her and her child and is looking to save some money. Now we're going to look at some other design use cases. The amount of drinking water on Earth is limited as is. Only 0.5 of Earth's water is drinking water. For perspective, if there was only 100 liters of water on Earth, only 0.5 liters would be safe to drink. Any device that can provide clean water is vital to the survival of the human race. The majority of fresh water comes from lakes, groundwater, and ice caps. This device is useful for many different applications and locations. These include coastal cities. These cities are perfect for our design because they are located beside large bodies of ocean water. Small fishing villages. These are usually located far from cities and have trouble accessing clean water, but they have plenty of impure water available. And finally, disaster relief. Places devastated by floods and tsunamis are situated in the perfect spot to produce clean water and help with the recovery effort. Seawater desalination is one of the best options for the future of water supply, but desalination isn't a miracle solution by any means. It has drawbacks that need to be carefully controlled. First and foremost, there are concerns of seawater desalination's effect on the environment around it through the release of brine. Brine is highly concentrated salt water that can kill plant life and thus hurt the surrounding ecosystem. Our product will employ dilution techniques to combat this. Another disadvantage of seawater desalination is its significant energy costs, which we have mitigated through an included solar panel. Finally, there are also concerns about the intake water containing fish or other marine life. We included a strainer on the intake pipe to minimize our effect on non-microscopic life forms. Now given the context of the problem, we want a solution that can use seawater and solar thermal energy to produce clean drinkable water that meets Canadian health and safety standards, and producing at least one liter per day. The device should be made of low-cost, readily available materials so that we can minimize the cost per liter of water. To help lower our cost per liter, the solution should also have a functional life of at least one year, requiring little, if any, maintenance, simplifying its operation. We initially came up with three designs shown from left to right. They all work on the same principle where a selective surface absorbs a large portion of the solar light causing the surface to warm up and send the heat into the water, causing it to boil. Designs 2 and 3 would have additional complexity in the form of pressurized chambers. These chambers would boost the efficiency of the device significantly, as they can recycle the heat to boil additional water. This idea was scrapped as it was deemed too complex, expensive, and made the device very dangerous if anything went wrong. As designs 2 and 3 were deemed inadequate for our purposes, we went with design 1. A model of the device and its general purposes is shown above. Seawater is pumped into the chamber within the device where it's held. Solar rays hit the selective surface and a solar collector which doubles the energy being absorbed. This energy causes the water to boil into steam leaving behind salt and other contaminants. The steam is then output and condensed into a safe drinking water. Once a day of operation is complete, the remaining brine which contains the salt and is flushed out of the system. For the main body construction, we went with a polyisocyanurate insulation. The insulating properties of the material help to minimize heat loss and keep in useful heat for evaporating water. The stiffness of this easy to work with material allows us to maintain structural integrity 
while keeping the weight considerably light for improved mobility. Since the top of the device needs to let in sunlight, it is subjected to greater heat losses from the heated selective surface. To mitigate these losses, we included a layer of FEP film above the selective surface, as the material is transparent, letting in sunlight, while also creating a sealed air gap between the two for a better insulating barrier. The film is durable and resistant to cracking, making it an attractive material for this high heat application. The device operates by letting in sunlight through the FEP layer heating up the selective surface. First seawater is pumped into the device, partially filling the lower evaporation chamber. The heated selective surface will then heat up the seawater via non-contact radiation. This is done to prevent fouling from salt deposits on the selective surface. Once the water reaches boiling point and evaporates, steam travels through the air gap and out of the steam outlet to be condensed into clean drinkable water. Once the majority of the seawater is evaporated, the remaining saturated salt water brine is left to be discarded out of the brine outlet. This is done to evacuate the system and avoid having salt deposits inside of the device. Once the device is empty, the system is ready for the cycle to repeat for continued use. Currently in the world, the vast majority of desalination is done through reverse osmosis process shown on the left in large, expensive and power intensive plants. Although these plants also produce clean water, it's not viable for a target customer as their countries either do not have the infrastructure to power the plants have unsafe water supply networks, or it's just too expensive to build. Other thermal desalination methods use heating elements. Typically over time, as it's used, there will be salt and other material buildup called fouling shown on the right, which greatly diminishes the performance making them uneconomical. Our device is unique as it uses a non-contact solution to boil the water. It only uses radiation so that there is no fouling buildup and the device can run for a long time without its performance being diminished. A thermal network simulation for the device was created. Its use was to determine the feasibility of our design and to perform testing on any change to design and in the conditions where we can't replicate. The simulation included interactions between almost all the components in the design to achieve the greatest possible accuracy. Next, a structural simulation was done to briefly analyze the effects of thermal expansion and contraction of the polyisocyanurate panels during operation. The resultant stresses indicate that the structure should not experience any static or fatigue failure under thermal loading. Our incurred costs account for the purchase of 25 distinct components from four distinct vendors. The top cost contributors include polycarbonate and fluorinated ethylene propylene from McMaster Car in Ohio and polyisocyanurate from Lowe's in Ontario. The total cost, including shipping and taxes, comes out to 1,158 Canadian dollars for the full physical prototype. In this section, we will look at the build process from cradle to grave. To start everything, we needed to come up with the right material, order them, and do simulations to make sure they could stand up to the pressure and the temperature. So after all of that, the fun part started. Time to build. To start, I went and picked up the sheets of polyiso from Lowe's. Then it was time to cut them to the right size. The next part was to put everything together and use silicon to make the base. Here, I learned not to use a big amount of silicon in an unventilated area. So I moved the base to my garage to work on it and let it cure overnight. Next step was to waterproof the inside. So I used the silicon to make a thin waterproof layer on the bottom of the base and the sides. And also I put in the water inlet, steam outlet and made sure they're waterproof too. The next step was to build the top layer. This section did require me to cut the polycarbonate to the right size, so I used the jigsaw to cut it in the right size. This part made the foundation on what everything else had to be built upon. As you saw, we did make a three layer design that means between our solar selective layer and the polycarbonate we decided to put an FEP layer, which could stand high temperatures and would help us lose less heat to the environment. This meant I had to start by making a frame for the FEP, glue it down, and put the FEP layer on it and put the next separator layer on top and let them cure for at least 24 hours. The last step for the solar collector was to put the selective layer down and bolt everything up. Although, as I did not have any experience working with these materials, I had to do a lot of experiments to make sure I found the right method to approach the situation without damaging any other parts. Next step was to put it all together and bolt them down. As it is seen in the next video, we have a great hold for the solar collector. 
The next part was to make a table and color the back of the selective layer black, seen in this video. We'll be putting on uh, goggles and also I have M95 that I will be putting on and um, I'll be wearing uh, gloves. After spray painting the back of the selective layer, for better heat radiation and putting on the temperature sensors, it was time to start testing. It was found that there were gaps in between the top and the bottom base, which made it possible for the vapor to escape through. Hence, I used a gasket and four clamps to put pressure down and stop the steam from coming out from the sides. This caused the system to start functioning very closely to the simulated results. Real-world testing results were acquired from temperature measurements in a physical solar test conducted in Ontario. After over two hours, the selective surface maintains above 100 degrees, after which the water soon starts to boil. Since Rio de Janeiro is closer to the equator, we expect that the results there will be generally more favorable. The physical testing results were extrapolated to the conditions in Rio de Janeiro using the simulation. The simulation showed that the desalinator would produce an average of 4.15 liters of water per day, for an average of 1,515 liters over the course of a year. This means that within a year, the average cost for a liter of water would be 76 cents, with the cost falling the more the device is used.